Welcome to the FaithBridge Sermon Podcast. We hope you're encouraged by the message. For more in-depth content and answers to questions submitted during the sermon, check out our podcast called Postscript. You can find it on iTunes or on our website at faithbridge.org forward slash podcast. Hey! (laughs) Well... Welcome to you as well. I'm glad you're here. I'm glad I'm here. I'm glad we're all here. Welcome in Center Court East. Welcome in Center Court West. Welcome in the Woodlands. Uh, And if you're watching online, welcome that way as well. So the psalmist said, my mouth will tell of your righteous deeds, of your saving acts all day long, though I know not how to relate them all. I'll come and proclaim your mighty acts, sovereign Lord. I'll proclaim your righteous deeds, yours alone. Your righteousness, God, reaches to the heavens. You who've done great things. As for me, I will always have hope. And I'll praise you more and more. Well, they say that a defining moment is a moment in someone's life that helps to define them. I had one about a month ago, and I thought I would tell you a little bit about it. Um, and, but that's not the only thing I wanna do, I wanna tell you about it, and then I want, uh, in a little while, to look at a passage from the book of Romans. So you can be turning there, Romans 8, and if you need a Bible, you can flag down the ushers and they'll bring you a Bible. Uh, that you can be looking at when we get to to that uh, portion. Let me do this, though, first. See this? This is a basket full of cards and notes and printed out emails and Facebook and just on and on and on that you all have sent. And I just want to say thank you very, very much for that. Suzanne joins me in that gratitude. We've felt the love so much, and I could not be uh, more grateful. So thank you very much for that. Well, I guess it was uh, three or four weeks ago on a Wednesday night, Suzanne and I were getting ready for bed, and I said, you know, there's this meeting tomorrow down in the Montrose area, area tomorrow morning, and it's not the sort of meeting... I have to go to. In fact, I could have missed it and not really hard to have been noticed. Then we vacillated and she was listening to me. And finally I said, well, but I guess I will go. And the next morning I got down to the meeting in the Montrose area and I was sitting around uh, listening and it took all of 20 minutes to conclude. I don't think I really needed to have bothered to come to this meeting, but it was going to last two hours, so there I was. So as discreetly as I could, I got my phone out and tried to return a few emails and get a little work done while the meeting was uh, going along. After it was over, I went for an early lunch and figured after lunch, I'll be able to get back up this way and uh, get some work done in the early afternoon, the rest of the afternoon. Well, as I was getting my car, after lunch, I got a text from Pastor Terry Takel, and the text said, I just was visiting with a dear family in the medical center. Uh, it's a 12-year-old boy who's dying of cancer. And Terry mentioned something about it. It's, it's so, situations like this are so sad, but we're praying. And, Well, I read it, and I I felt that, and I thought, oh, my gosh, how sad. How sad for the the kid and for his parents, and how would I feel? And and then it occurred to me, wait, I'm a stone's throw from the medical center myself. I could just go over, and I could see them, too. So I I pulled out of the uh, driveway of the place where I'd eaten lunch and went this way instead of that way and and headed towards the medical center and sure enough found their room and and the the boy was was hard asleep. Um, But his mom was there and we got to sit and have a nice conversation for a little while and at the end um, we went up and we stood by his bed and I led in a prayer and 
those situations really are so, so, uh, so challenging, so sad, so hard. And you wish that you could do more. And, but afterwards, I said, well, I'm praying for you. And she said, you know, thanks so much for coming. And we bid each other farewell. I was heading down the hallway back to my car. And as I was walking, I started to feel this feeling right in here that I thought it must be something I ate just a little while ago. Kind of the heartburn feeling. And by the time I got down to my car, I remembered, wait a second, you've been having this heartburn problem for several weeks. You've been feeling this for, I don't know, two, three, maybe even four weeks, off and on. And <clears throat> I was sitting in the car thinking to myself, gosh, here I am in the medical center, looking up at all the medical center buildings, and I'm thinking, boy, wouldn't it be nice if I had an appointment while I'm here, because who wants to make another appointment, go back home, and then come back down, and here I am. And, but I didn't have an appointment. And it was right then I remembered the GI doctor who did a colonoscopy on me seven years ago. And I remember the odd thing about that was seven years ago, at the end of the deal, um, he said, hey, I'm going to give you my cell number, and if you ever need to call for anything, you just feel free to call. I remember thinking, well, that's mighty nice. And so I started thinking, I wonder if I still have that number. And I'd look over it, and sure enough, there it was. So I texted him, and I said, Dr. Dobbs, this is Ken Werline. You did a colonoscopy on me seven years ago. <laughs> And now I have the worst heartburn, and I'm wondering if you're the sort of doctor that looks at one's innards on the top side as well as the bottom side, <laughs> because I need someone to look at my top side now. And I pressed send. And the moment after I pressed send, I remember thinking, oh my God, that was the stupidest <laughs> text I've ever sent to anybody before. <laughs> By then I had chewed a few thumbs up that I found in the car, and convinced myself, you're feeling better anyhow. And I started to, to pull out to, to, uh, to head back up this direction. But sure as I was just getting ready to move the car, the, the phone vibrated, beep, and I looked down, and there he had texted a reply. Dr. Dobbs said, yes, certainly I'm that kind of doctor. When would you be available for an office visit? I said, really? Believe it or not, uh, I could come right now. In fact, I'm just around the corner from you. And <clears throat> he texted right back, and he said, well, that's great. Come on up. I'm seeing patients all afternoon, and we'll just work you in. It may take a while, but we'll get you worked in. And I said, well, great, thanks. I'll be there. So I went around the corner, parked the car, and went up to his office. I waited for 45 minutes, I don't know, maybe an hour. And sure enough, they worked me in, and we went back, sat down uh, in his office, and he began to ask me the typical kind of intake questions that, you, that a doctor asks. And I was describing the feeling. He says, when you feel it, well, it's sort of here, it's sometimes here, it's just kind of, you're right in there. And, and <clears throat> he said, well, let me ask you this, Reverend. Has it ever just knocked you back to where you had to sit down? I said, yes, it has. Several weeks ago, I was at the gym, and I was on the elliptical machine, and I like to do the elliptical machine. Usually, I go 30, sometimes 40 minutes, and I don't think I had gone three, four, five minutes max, and I felt it. I felt it so strong. I, I finally just I, I don't think I can do this. So I just got off and sat down, and, and after a little while, I felt a little better, and so I just did a few light weights and, and called it a day. He said, huh, ever felt it like that other times? I said, well, as a matter of fact, I was at the gym yesterday. Because, see, I had this trainer and a couple times uh, of, a week, and, and we were doing these step-ups, you know, where you step on this thing, and you go for a minute, and then you get a few seconds to, <laughs> then you go another minute. And, and <clears throat> we were doing that little deal. And in between the minutes, I, I had to sit down. I don't usually have to sit down. I was like, because <sighs> I remember thinking, man, what are you eating that is doing this to you? At that point, he said, Reverend, you're giving me confusing signals. He says, you're giving me symptoms on both sides of the ledger. You are describing some acid reflux, heartburn, GERD kind of um, symptoms. But I don't know if you've realized, you're also describing some cardio symptoms. And the telltale sign for me, he said, is twice you've closed your fist and you've gone 
to describe the feeling. I said, yeah. That, he says, you don't realize it, but that's kind of a nonverbal sign that cardiac patients always use describing heart problems. I said, huh. He said, who's your cardiologist? And I said, well, I don't have one, which is kind of embarrassing when I'm <laughs> considering how good of a hypochondriac I am. <laughs> I, <clears throat> I, I don't have one. So he, he looks up in his phone and he said, well, let me call my friend Stuart Solomon. And <clears throat> so he calls him up, and clearly they're friends, and they chuckle about a little joke or something for a moment. And he says, well, I'm sitting here with Reverend Werline, and he's kind of giving me some symptoms on both sides of the ledger, and, and I'd like for him to come over and, and see you. Would you work him in? Yeah, good. Okay, I'll send him over. Thanks, bye. Hangs up. Says, okay, now, Reverend, I want you to go over to his office. He's a couple buildings down, so you just drive down there, park in their garage, go up, and... and uh, He'll get you worked in just like we did. I said, okay, well, boy, thanks very much. And last thing he said, he said, Reverend, take your time. When you're walking, just walk slowly. <laughs> I said, okay. Well, I got over to the other building and rode up, and the door opens on the 30th floor, and, and there's this lady. And right there, she says, what's your name? And I said, my name's Ken Werlein. She says, come with me. So I'm walking with her. She hands me a clipboard. She says, you can fill all this out while I'm working on you. We get in the room. She starts sticking these things all over me and starts asking me questions, and I'm trying to fill out the things as well. And, and <clears throat> we're going along, and, and after a while, Dr. Solomon comes in, and he says, well, here, you've got some stuff maybe going on. I said, well, I've never thought of it before, but I guess maybe I do. He says, well, your resting EKG is, is, is fine. Describe to me what you're, what you're feeling. I described it. He said, do you exercise? I said, yeah, oh, yeah, I like to exercise. I know it doesn't show because I, I supplement with some extra calories afterwards, but <laughs> I, I do. And, and, you know, I have a trainer several times a week, and I do the elliptical machine in between. So I'm usually there three definitely, sometimes four, and even occasionally five times a week. He's like, okay. He says, you ever feel it there? I was like, yes. I started to tell him the same two accounts that I had just mentioned to the other doctor. And it was then I thought, uh-oh. I'm not describing heartburn, am I? After a while, he said, come with me. We went back to this room, and he said, I, I'm, I want you to do, uh, get on the treadmill, and I want to watch what's happening. And you need to tell us if you feel the Because he'd said, are you feeling it now? And I said, I don't think I'm feeling it right now. He says, okay, if you feel it, I want you to say, Feel it. Don't, don't just keep going. I said, okay. And <clears throat> so I got on, and I'm all wired up and the cuff, you know, and, and I start walking, and, and everything's fine. It goes a little faster. It goes a little steeper. goes a little faster. goes a little steeper. Doing fine. Finally, we're up to a point where it's, it's not like an, you're running, but it's faster than you can really walk, so you're kind of jogging, and I'm doing that deal, and I felt the feeling. And I said to the technician, uh, I think I'm feeling the feeling. I think I better stop it. And, and that thing came to a stop. He said, just sit down right there. And so I sat down. I said, can I have some water? And he got me a cup of water. He said, yeah, sure. And <clears throat> he took the paper out to the doctor. And a moment later, we went out and we met around the corner. He said, Mr. Whirling, you felt the feeling, didn't you? I said, yeah, I think I felt the feeling. He said, come here, sit down. We need to talk. I said, okay. He said, you realize you failed, your heart failed the stress test. I said, well, I kind of figured so. <clears throat> he said, I had a feeling you would because of what you had described from the gym. He says, I've got bad news. You have very high ST elevation, which means you've got the worst kind of damage that you could hope for. It's telling me you're trying to have a heart attack. It's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. I think it's gonna happen in the next 24 hours. I was like, wow. He said, I don't even wanna send you home. I said, well, I don't even wanna go home. <laughs> so we're on the same page. And <clears throat> I said, so what do we need to do? He said, we're gonna go 
down the street to Methodist. We're going to go to the cath lab, and I want to get there first. And I'll go in with a balloon, and I'll open up the artery, and then we'll put a stent in. I said, okay. Sounds good to me. He says, if everything goes right, a couple of hours, we'll be done, you'll be good. He said, if there are any complications, we'll deal with the complications as they arise. He said, call your wife. I said, okay. So he said, I'll be back in a moment. So now that's an awkward conversation. What? Hey, baby, you know, I went to this meeting that I didn't really want to go to, and then I had lunch, and then I got this text, and then I went to the GI doctor, and he sent me to the, to the cardio doctor, and then I failed the stress test, and now I'm going to have a heart attack in the next 24 hours. Can you believe that? <laughs> Could you come? And she said, oh, my gosh. Let me get the boys taken care of, and, and I'll be there. Well, at that point, Dr. Solomon uh, came back in. Now, by, by this point, in the, it, it was evening time. It was, people had kind of been leaving the office. And it was probably 6.30 or so. It's sort of the sun was setting. And Dr. Solomon said, just follow me. And so I started to walk behind him. He said, we're just going to walk slowly. I said, okay. I had a briefcase because I always take some work to work wherever I go just so I don't be bored. And he said, let me... Um, let me take that and I'll carry that for you. I said, well, okay. We get to the elevator and he said, if it, if it wasn't so urgent, I'd let you go by yourself and you, you check yourself in tonight and for observation, we'd get to it in the morning. But this one's urgent. I said, well, I kind of gathered that. Thank you. So we ride down the elevator. We walk out and he unlocks his car. And he opens up the passenger door. He says, here, just sit carefully. <laughs> so I crawled in the passenger side, and <clears throat> he got in the car, and we went down his garage and out on the Fannin Street and over to the Skurlock garage, and he wheels in the Skurlock garage, and he comes around and helps me kind of get out, and... We walk a little ways, and then he sees a wheelchair. And um, he says, perfect. He says, I want you to sit in this. I'll, I'll push. And as he's pushing me a, across the overpass over Fannin, I said, I really appreciate the care that you're showing me. I mean, I'm very humbled by this. And he said quietly, well, I'm certain you'd do the same for me. And I said, well, I'm certain if I knew what you knew, <laughs> I would do the same for you. It's interesting, when we were going across, he, going to the hospital, he said, um, I had a friend years ago, this big guy, and he had what you have. And the next morning he was gone. And ever since then, I don't mess around. Even if it's at the end of the day, we're, we're not going to let this go. Well, again, thank you. We get into the Methodist hospital, up to the elevator shaft, and up to Dun 10, and <clears throat> or he wheels me around to the nurse's station, and the nurses sort of jump up and said, we, we can help him, doctor. And he said, I want to see him in the cath lab immediately. And he said to me, I'll see you in a moment. And he went off, and one of the nurses said, here will be your room, and put on this and have you ever seen that, the, uh, that movie with Jack Nicholson, Something's Gotta Give, um, <laughs> where you, you get this horrible nightgown, and it's horrible because your fanny's hanging out the back, and it, it doesn't go the whole way around. And so I shimmied up onto the gurney, and pew, off we go down to the cath lab. Well, as we're rolling along, I'm looking up, seeing the ceiling tiles, as we're going along, and I finally had a moment to, to pray. And it was then I said, well, Lord, boy, this is a, uh, I didn't see this coming. And I said, Lord, you know, Lord, I, I guess this could be the night that I get off. And if so, I'll finally get to meet you in person tonight. And that's awesome. And I felt so peaceful at that thought. You know, it's sort of um, what Paul said, to, to die is, is gain when you're in Christ. But for this thought that came across my mind, I thought of my family. 
and particularly my seven and, and ten-year-old boys. And I said, but Lord, I just don't feel like I'm finished. I just, I feel like there's some stuff still in me that I want to get into them as they grow into manhood, and I just haven't finished it yet. And I said, so Lord, for their sake, would you please just help Dr. Solomon to get there first and get this whole thing worked out? And even as we were rolling along, that verse, I think is Isaiah 26, thou will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee. That verse just kept rolling in my, in my head, and I just felt that peace. And in we went to the cath lab. When you go in there, you, they don't really put you all the way out. They just sort of loop you up uh, a, a little bit. So I don't remember very much, but I do remember um, at the end of the procedure, Dr. Solomon leaned over and he said, Mr. Werlein, everything went great. We're in good shape. And I said, fantastic. And he said to one of the attendants, he said, print, print him out a picture of what we were just looking at. You want to see what you looked like when you got here? I said, yes, sir. I would like to see. He said, we'll send you home with this. And, and so you want to see? Here's, here, okay, see that thing going down where the arrow is? That's called the LAD artery. And some people call that the widow maker. And you see how right there where the arrow is pointing, um, there's not much. That was the thread um, that was keeping me alive, unbeknownst to me. All right, but now you want to see what it looks like now? How about that? So, yeah, praise the Lord. <laughs> nice and juicy. So uh, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Dr. Solomon. Thank you, heart stint. And he said to Suzanne and the others who were waiting with her in the room, waiting room, when he came out and talked to them, he, he apparently said, we were within about a 12-hour window of a very different outcome for your husband. Well, as you might imagine, <clears throat> this gives one some things to think about. And I've been thinking a lot the last several weeks. Incidentally, people, many of you have asked sorts of questions like, well, do you feel so much better than you were feeling then? Did you feel so bad then? And, and does it run in your family? And what are you taking now? And, and what are you doing differently? And these sorts of things, all good questions. The very sorts of questions that I would be asking as well. And I realize the reason most of you are asking those questions is because you're kind of trying to gauge your life up against it and say, well, do you think I got one too? You know, and, and I'm no doctor and I can't say, um, but I will say this. Um, I think I've heard about a dozen people who went and got checkups um, it, after this incident, and it's good for you, and I highly recommend it. And, <clears throat> and, and in fact, the best of the stories is about a lady who, because of this story, when she heard she got her blood pressure checked, it was so astronomical, they rushed her to the hospital, and she spent, I think it was three nights, I heard, and to get her numbers back in, in more of a healthy place. And so, you know, praise the Lord for that. Here's what I want to do, though. I don't want to spend the rest of the time talking about those sorts of things, although those are valid questions. So we're going to do a little different type of postscript this time. If, if you want to ask those kind of questions, uh, how do you feel? What do you, you know, text those in. And, and so the postscript won't be so theological this time. It'll just be more experiential um, slash meta medical, but I'm not a doctor. So, you know, I'm just gonna, all I can do is tell you my experience. All right. So what I want to do in our final minutes is I want to move now from my testimony to God's word. And I would like to highlight from this passage two unshakable truths that I want to send you out of here with today. Okay. Let me read to you from Romans chapter eight. In, in verse 28, we'll start. And we know that God causes all things to work together for the good to those who love God and to those who are called according to his purpose. Now we'll jump to 38. 
For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Two bedrock truths. The first one comes from verse 28. All things are working together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purposes. Now, what does that mean? What does that mean exactly? It means this. It means that God is weaving together for our good and his glory every single thing that ever happens. That's what it says. And as I've pondered the list of, of choices that I made that day to go to the meeting and the text and the hospital and this doctor and one thing after the next, I, I, I can't help myself just over and over that, that passage in Proverbs has come to mind. Proverbs 16, 9. We can make our plans, but the Lord determines our steps. This means we make our own plans, but when we actually commence, uh, when we start doing those plans, somehow it always fits in with God's great plan. Now, if you're like me, sometimes you wonder, well, so now how does that work? It, I mean, how does man's freedom and the choices that we're making, how does that fit together with God's sovereignty and how he's weaving it all together and it's all part of his great plan? And, and you know something? I don't know. But I've just decided I'm not qualified to be God and so I don't have to know. But it, I, I do know that the Bible says it's both. That God is absolutely sovereign and we are absolutely free agents that are held responsible for our choices. But that none of those choices will ever knock him off his throne or not be masterminded and woven into the great tapestry of his plan. I don't understand. We tend to be either or kind of people. But the Bible's sort of both and on this one. And we see that. We see it biblically in numerous instances, but never more clearly, perhaps, than the story of Joseph. Remember Joseph and the coat of many colors? And you remember how uh, there in Genesis, his brothers sell him off because they hate him and they're envious of him and he's more beloved than they are by the father. And <clears throat> where's the coat around to show it? And, and so they sell him off into slavery and he gets hauled down to Egypt. And if you were to stop there, you know, when the brothers are telling the dad, well, he's dead, eh, that's the end of Joseph, you would think this is a horrible story. But of course, you read on all the way through chapter 50 of Genesis, and you see Joseph gets down there to Egypt, and one thing and another, and the Pharaoh needs a dream interpreted, and he interprets the dream, and he explains, well, see, what it really means is there's going to be seven years of famine, and you better save up some grain, like seven years of grain. And the Pharaoh says, well, why don't you kind of help us do this, because you kind of understand all this stuff, so why don't you be the organizer? And so Joseph's second in command in all of Egypt, and years later... Who comes calling for food? His brothers. And ultimately his father, he would be reunited with. It's a very powerful, touching scene when they're all reunited and Joseph explains who he is. And you get to that point of the story and you say, huh, God was never not in control of all that was happening there. Well, weren't the choices that the brothers made, weren't those horrible? Yes, they were horrible choices. Yes, they're mean, cruel. But somehow God was working it together for good. So I guess you could say several weeks ago, the Lord just pulled back the curtain in my life just enough to let me see how totally in control he is. So why do I share this with you today? Well, certainly because I want to give him the glory that he's due and the gratitude, but also for this reason. My hope is that through maybe hearing the story today, your trust in him would be bolstered. I know mine has been. And so is our friend Lawrence. 
Lauren and Pete are friends through, well, through church, but also through baseball. Uh, we have kids who play on the same baseball team. And, and several weeks ago at baseball practice <clears throat> one evening, I was telling her and some others who were standing around, I was telling some of the story that I just told you. And I could sense that Lauren was particularly interested and, and, and really tuned in, although I didn't understand why then I would understand a few days later when she sent an email to me, which I asked her permission several days ago. Could I share some of that with the congregation? And she said, yeah, if that would be helpful, you, you certainly can. I want to read to you something that she wrote. Pastor Ken, listening to you describe your day leading up to the surgery, the GI doctor you met seven years ago whose number you still had and him seeing patients that day and recognizing your nonverbal communication when you put your fist over your heart led me back to some fears and worry that have so dictated my life for the past 10, 15, even 20 years. She says, you see, I, I've had numerous traumatic experiences which have shaped my life and dictated a lot of who I am today. The greatest and most traumatic of these being the loss of my father nearly 10 years ago. My father went on a mission trip after Hurricane Katrina to Beaumont to help rebuild homes. He owned his own construction company for 16 years. Wasn't certain about going on the trip since the company wasn't doing so well at the time of the trip. Well, as it turned out, my father and another gentleman were walking under a portion of the home when the roof collapsed and trapped my father and the other gentleman. My father died immediately. The other man survived. Both men had families. Both men were there to serve others, yet my dad was the one who lost his life. I share this story not for sympathy, but because after our talk, I realized that event has shaped much of my what-if mentality in life. If something can ever go wrong, this is where my mind takes me first. Not to pray about the situation or hand it over to the Lord or be submissive to the Lord, but to worry and to obsess and to keep myself from enjoying many things. So circling back to the other night at the boys' baseball practice, your words spoke directly to my soul. Your what-ifs painted this beautiful tapestry in my mind of how the Lord is standing by us every second of every day. Sort of like a conductor leading a symphony. He has the pieces all set in place. All we need to do is stop and listen to him and recognize his presence and follow him. She says, Wednesday night, I was brought to tears realizing how mighty and great our God truly is. It's true, he really is in control. He's sovereign. Second thing, the other thing, and this comes from verses 37 to 38. Nothing can ever separate you from the love of Christ. Our worship leader, uh, John Sherrill, he said to me the first time I saw him after this, he said, man, when I read that whole thing of kind of what happened to you, the first thought that came to my mind was, Ken must feel so loved by the Father. I said, yeah, it is true. I mean, I know that God has always loved me. I've always felt that, but I'll tell you, I've never felt it as acutely as unforgettably, as recently. Now, let me anticipate something that I know is going through many of your minds right now, okay? I know what you're thinking. Many of you right now, you're thinking, yeah, but, yeah, you just talked about this lady whose dad got killed, and what about then? What if the outcome hadn't been so good? Then what? What about when the widow maker makes a widow? Or, or when a child is taken. What about, what about then, Ken? Trust me. I've been thinking a lot about that. Particularly as I learned that 
the 12-year-old who, whose room I visited that day, Simon, did die of cancer. I have thought about this. What about then? Is he not loving us then, the Lord? Is, has something separated us from his love after all? No, that can't be it because, because he says clearly nothing can separate us from the love of Christ. So what about then? You know, it's interesting. When I was talking to Simon's mom that day and that conversation that just lasted long enough to keep me downtown, I remember asking her, I said, well, I'm curious. You've been through so much. You're going through so much. It's gone on for a couple of years. Through all this, I asked, Has God felt farther away or closer than ever? She said without hesitating, oh, closer than ever. No doubt about it. We've just felt his presence. We've seen his hand just so many different ways, closer than ever. Which shouldn't surprise me. It shouldn't surprise you. Because Christians throughout history, people who have followed Christ throughout history have attested to this experience in the midst of sufferings, feeling the presence and and the love of Christ even more than when they're not suffering. Perhaps it's because only in suffering is it that we're finally able to hear the whispers of the Lord say to us, I know what it feels like to suffer. I know what it feels like to be betrayed. I know what it feels like to be abandoned. I know what it feels like to die an agonizing death. I know what that feels like. I've been there too. Or to hear the whispers of the Father say to our hearts, I know what it feels like to lose your child because I lost mine. Watched him die on a cross. See, we tend to forget God is sovereign, yet he did not exempt himself from the realities of this fallen world, from suffering and from pain and even from death. He didn't exempt, even though he is sovereign and he's in charge of everything, he said, no, 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 I'm going to come into this world. I'm going to play by the same rules. That means I'm going to suffer as well. That means I'm going to die for you on a cross. He didn't immunize himself, in other words. He said, I'm going to come closer, closer than ever. And this is why, friends, in good times, yes, but in bad times also, he says, nothing, nothing, nothing can separate you from my love. Nothing can. Now, I bet if you haven't felt his love before, that it's probably for this reason. It's probably that you have kept it too uh, abstract and too theoretical. Sort of like, well, I know God's out there somewhere, and so he probably got a little love for me somewhere out there. And, you know, you've kept it too abstract and too theoretical. You have to make it personal. It has to get personal if it's going to really touch you. And don't you realize his love was never made more personal than through Jesus Jesus is the love of God coming here to this earth, living the life of perfection that we couldn't live for ourselves, and then saying, I'll die now the death of consequence that you deserve to die. I'll step in and I'll die in your place. I'll take the hit for you. Now, if that isn't love, I don't know what what is. You have to let it get personal and ponder that. Look back at the Garden of Gethsemane. Look back at the cross, and, 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 and you can't help but miss it. All the greatest forces of the universe were bearing down on him, and he could have stopped it. He, could, he had all the power in his hand. He could have stopped that. He could have stopped the torture. He could have stopped the death. All he had to do was give up on you and me. All he had to do was quit. Just walk away. But he didn't. Charles Spurgeon, I think it was, said Jesus was up on the cross, nailed, bleeding, dying, looking down upon those people who betrayed him and who'd forsaken him and denied him. And in his greatest act of love in the history of the universe, he stayed. 
He stayed for you and for me. And so Tim Keller writes, bomb after bomb after bomb was coming down on Jesus, trying to get him to drop us, trying to get him to separate from us. And even hell itself couldn't do it. He stayed. Nothing could separate his love from us. He died for us. So friends, that's how you can know that you can know that you know. Nothing will ever separate us from the love of Christ. If he wouldn't drop us then, he's not going to drop you now. And so that's why it is that Paul just can't help himself. He just bursts forth at the end of this passage. For I'm convinced that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor things present nor things to come nor powers nor height nor depth nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Nothing can separate us from him. So what am I saying today? Two things. He is both the sovereign king, he is in control. And he's our loving father. Of these two things, I am more certain than ever. And I hope that you will be too. Let's pray together. Thanks, Lord, for the reality that you are king, you're sovereign, you are in control, that somehow the things that we're doing fit into your great plan. Doesn't make any sense to our minds how that could possibly be, but then that's why we're not God. So, Lord, thank you that you're in control. Thank you, God, that you're a loving father, that your heart is just full of love for your children. And never did we see it so clearly as when, Jesus, you came and you hung on the cross for us, standing in our place, when you could have stopped it all, but you didn't. My prayer, Lord, is that each of us, as we go from here today, might ponder these unshakable truths, these um, bedrock realities, that they will shape the way that we look at life every day when we get up and when we head into the day and when we lie down at the end of a day. And Lord, if there's anybody here who hadn't opened up their hearts to Jesus in the first place, trusting in you, putting their life in your hands, my prayer, Lord, is that even in the quietness of this moment, you'd give them the grace and the strength to say, I need you, Jesus. I want you to come in to my life. We're praying all of these things in your strong name, Lord. Amen. Welcome to Postscript from Faithbridge Church. Here we hope to answer your questions and help you dig deeper into the message by sitting down with the teacher of the day. I'm Lou Ann Riley, Grow Group Director, and I'm here with Pastor Ken, who just told us the story of your near miss. Um, <laughs> yes, but like you said earlier, um, that you're so glad to be back, and we are glad to have uh, you back and here. And so you talked about in the message today a little bit um, about addressing some things further in postscript, clearing up some things, the most popular questions that people sure. want to ask you about what happened, yeah. um, basically the medical side of it yeah, that we right. didn't talk as much about today. So I'm just gonna ask you a few questions about that Good. and then we'll talk um, a little bit more about the message and some questions that came in about that. Great. Um, so tell me, how are you feeling? I feel great. Compared to before? How well, now see, that's the thing. People, everybody says, so you must feel so much better than you felt before. And the truth is, I felt fine before, except in those instances that I described, like when I was at the gym and so what is that? But and I think that must be why they call it the silent killer, because I didn't feel bad. In fact, you know, the people who saw the video, because we had recorded that sermon on a Tuesday before this happened on a Thursday, which people saw the video on Sunday and said, they didn't look that bad. 
Well, I didn't feel that bad. So I felt okay then and I feel great now. So okay. it's stuff on the inside. So the other questions being, um, does this run in your family? Yeah, is it hereditary, well, see, diet? Right. What would you attribute to right. the? I've been doing a little learning about that. Well, first of all, it doesn't run in my family. Uh, so, but there's uh, several things, you know, the, um, most people know this, but I've been reminding myself, there's nine markers that they say you're, you're always gonna be wanting to look out for. And those are smoking, your lipids, like cholesterol, mm -hmm. Uh, high blood pressure, psychosocial factors like stress, diet, alcohol uh, consumption, diabetes, physical activity, inactivity. Did I say obesity? Um, so that's nine. Well, I went through and said, hmm, I definitely don't have six of those. Um, I'm carrying about 20, 25 extra pounds. Well, I was, now that's down. Um, so I'm working on that one, the stress, trying to work on that. I don't exactly know how you work on that exactly, but, um, and, and then there was maybe one other one, uh, not smoking, not physical inactivity. Oh, the lipids. Yeah, my cholesterol was on the high end of normal. In fact, in my most recent checkup, I had said to the doctor, I said, you think I ought to take a, a statin just to knock it down a little? And, and he had said, you know, we could go either way on your situation because you're within normal, but you're on the high end. Mm -hmm. And so we agreed we'll just watch it um, a little bit and see if I could bring it down a little bit on my own. But then that night he texted me in the hospital, guess we're going on the Lipitor. And um, so, you know, the doctor said an interesting thing. Uh, he said, I know you're going to want to pinpoint why mm -hmm. this happened. And it's particularly frustrating when it doesn't run in your family. And when you don't drink and smoke and, you know, he said, sometimes people just get a condition and he said everything else looked good in you he said I, I think probably a plaque moved and then got dislodged got dislodged and then moved and then jammed um, right there and he said sometimes people just get unlucky mm -hmm. but then we agreed that the Lord had uh, more than taken care of uh, that unlucky situation well, I'm glad that you're feeling good now yeah, and uh, have your treatment. Um, so I know that you spoke a little bit about talking to God as you were going through the process. Mm -hmm. And I know prayer was a huge part. Yeah. Plenty of people praying for yeah, you. Right. And um, so the question that came in is around that today. And specifically yeah. it says, if God is in charge of every step, should we be praying for protection? Should we pray for healing? Does it make a difference? Can it change the outcome? Um, and I know in these moments, yeah. that's, that's what you do. Yeah, what? Right. Yeah, and which is a great question. All of those variations of the question are great questions. Several thoughts about that. We know, well, what I wanted to try to emphasize in the talk was that God is absolutely sovereign and he's absolutely our loving father. And how those fit together, um, well, not so much the loving father part, but, but our, regarding specifically the sovereignty, how does our choice and our freedom f fit into that? The challenge I think for us, and I think the questioner is probably characterizing this, we want to make it either or. Mm -hmm. It either is all up to us and we're determining this thing and, or it's up to God and he's already determined it. And, but in scripture, it's both. And this is the great mystery. And so where does that line sort of 
where does the end of our free will and the beginning of his sovereignty, the end of his sovereignty, the beginning of our, how does all that, well, that's why I said, I've just decided I, I cannot, I, well, I'm not God, I'm not qualified, I don't have to understand, but it is both. And you see evidence of that. You see it like when you go back um, and you see Moses um, there who in that situation after the Ten Commandments and the rebellious um, Israelites and God is done with them and just he's just so upset. And what does Moses do? Moses says, no, God. Mm -hmm. He pleads with him. He says, think about it, God. Think about it. Think how the Egyptians will just laugh if you wipe us out. Ha ha, they took them, their God took them into the desert and then killed them all. You know, and so you really get the sense, okay, Moses was affecting the future. He, his intervening, his, his, his prayer, talking with the Lord, was doing some good. But then he is sovereign, and so in his great plan, I'm, obviously he knew that was what was going to happen, and they're the promised uh, chosen people, and they're going into the promised land, and that was going to happen. You know, so how does it all fit together? I don't know. Um, but Jesus himself said, uh, not if, but when you pray. So he calls us to prayer. Well, if that was a meaningless uh, effort, it, it's, why would he have said, I want you to do this? Um, and so clearly uh, there is an intertwining that is, that is going on that we really, that we, we can't exactly see or understand. And I heard one person, my father-in-law, in fact, was, he gave an illustration. He was talking about the sovereignty of God and the, and the free freedom of man. And he said, it's, it's sort of like this. If you were at a picnic and there was a big birthday cake and you had a pack of ants over here, and you know how ants will find their way to the sweets at a picnic. And he said, now suppose the ants are, are headed this way and you came along and you just, you put a barrier, you just put your thumb there as a barrier. Um, well, the ants are gonna go to this side or to this side, or they might nibble on you. Um, and then suppose the ones that are going way over here, you move your thumb there. Well, then they're gonna go here. And the point being, there is both going on. The, the ants are making choices and you in after watching their choices, uh, replacing your finger and, you know, sort of guiding them along the way. And I don't know, perhaps in God's great plan, that's a, a little concept of the great thing that he's doing that we really can't understand on this side. But I would say to the questioner, definitely keep on praying. What were the other variations of the, the, the question? Um, um, should we pray for healing? Sure, absolutely. Uh, because, in, in, and we see in scripture, d d d d absolutely do that. In, in James, uh, let's come together and anoint those who are sick and let's pray and let's fast and God's gonna work. There's the expectation. And, but I love how you tied it back to in life or death, regardless of the outcome of the prayer, yeah. God's love is still never failing. That's right. It is. That's absolutely right. Yes. Um, so glad to have you back. Thank Great you. message. Back. Loved hearing your story today. Um, and um, we thank you for your questions. Join us back here next week with Rob Morris from Love 146. Thank you. Thanks for joining us for Postscript. Help us keep the podcast interactive by submitting your questions during the morning services. Learn more at faithbridge.org forward slash postscript.